Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to Protea Society of uh, Thessaloniki and in Proteas TV. Uh, one more uh, cable presentation uh, on air, an, an initiative that uh, started uh, four years ago uh, during uh, COVID with many different uh, caving uh, presentations. Uh, so today uh, we are together with uh, Christos and uh, Rostam for uh, one more presentation. Uh, Rostam, welcome to Proteas TV. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> uh, Christo, I don't know if you want to uh, make a short uh, introduction and then uh, yeah. the floor. Uh, Bef yeah, before I start with a um, short survey about Rostam, that uh, it is online, I just want to say that although this is like a, a YouTube live uh, broadcasting, it is a webinar. So, but we couldn't. Uh, host this webinar for, because since there are so many people that uh, they are interested in following this webinar we couldn't host it in, in one of these mainstream uh, i don't know video calling uh, video chatting platforms that's why we are uh, decided to do it on youtube and it might be a little bit uh, like uh, weird but i will ask from the audience if they have any questions just to to post the questions on the youtube on the feed and then me and yours, we will stop Rostam and uh, ask the question for on behalf of the people that they are following. Uh, so I don't know, but it's uh, also uh, about Rostam. So I don't know if you know him, but uh, he's a well-known figure among the uh, caving uh, <laughs> society. Uh, Rostam is a doctor in the NHS, uh, if it is still the case, uh, the backbone yeah. of the uh, health system in UK. He has 14 years of uh, caving experience and he caved, uh, he made more than 700 tri trips. Uh, he followed uh, 16, ex uh, uh, he followed expeditions in uh, 16 countries, right? Different countries. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, and North America, uh, he's using the. Uh, he's yeah. In my opinion, he's one in uh, paperless cave surveying, and uh, he started his caving career with the Sheffield University Speleological Society, and now he's a member of the Wilden Cave and Mine Society. Yeah. He has. Uh, he was a publications and information officer, a youth and development officer of the British Caving Association from 2015 until 2022. And uh, the best thing about Rostam is that he is an author uh, of the anthology of Spilio music, uh, the seventh edition. There's a yeah. He edited the volume six. <laughs> So this is actually this is one of the most impressive things about your CV. Prosta. If but, anyone has the fortune yeah. to buy that book, I'm so sorry. It's a it's a it's a book of jokes. That there is no no sincere yeah. validity to any of it. But yeah, I'm a I'm a diehard caver. What can I say? <laughs> but now. Uh, the stage is yours, so you can we can start with the presentation, and we will uh, yeah we will interrupt you as you go. Yeah, brilliant. So, please go on. Yeah, so God, you make me sound very formal, uh, Christos. <laughs> I, uh, um, when when you asked me to do this, I thought that yeah. it was great. You know, oh, I'll I'll get a couple of people, and then you're like, oh, loads of people are coming. So. Um, this is a really new experience for me, but uh, I hope uh, we can get everything working because I've uh, arrived rather late uh, for this, unfortunately, due to my clinical commitments. So we're going to have a little bit of a whistle-stop tour. Okay. Through. So uh, introduction to people of surveying. Um, I started out surveying probably like a lot of people watching this. Um, I um, were, started out on compass, clino and tape. Uh, traditional surveying and and uh, was working with paper. Um, uh, my first expedition was out to Morocco. Uh, got got taught how to how to do how to do book because I was quite good at drawing. 
Um, and it was only um, actually once I sort of uh, spat out the other end of the university system that um, I went on an expedition where I had to use pocket topo. Um, and from then on, really, I, I've I've ditched the paper and been full paperless. Um, having surveyed in lots of places, I've seen lots of different surveying styles, um, uh, particularly in uh, Tennessee, where disto paper is very commonly used. And I'm, I'm quite aware of how how people haven't migrated through to paperless. And I think there are quite a few common issues with it. Um, and so for some people, it can be quite scary. So what I'm hoping to do with this presentation is basically just break everything down um, so that if you're going to manage a paperless project or at least start some paperless surveying, that actually you can, you know, you know where to start from. Right. So what are we doing here? Uh, <laughs> I'll very briefly go on to out of plan a project, um, basic surveying methodology, uh, what equipment uh, you can use the various limitations of each bit of equipment, um, available software and post-processing, uh, TopoDroid and how to set up TopoDroid for your device and for you, um, uh, basically because you've got to pick one. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've written, please have TopoDroid X installed and ready. Don't worry if you don't, uh, but it's much more useful if you're able to fiddle around uh, whilst we're going on. Um, Therion and sort of the basics of how to draw and process and um, then we'll, we'll end it with some questions. Now there may well be some technical issues at the end of this because I'm not sure whether I can share my screen or not because hopefully I would um, quite like to open a Therion file just to sort of quickly run people through things but it's not the most important bit. So why me? You know you heard uh, Christos' <laughs> very generous uh, introduction that I might have written, uh, you know, and I've said all, all of the previous bit, but the most important thing about paperless surveying is to have a go. And I have no qualms in saying I'm a bit of a have a go idiot. And that's how I've managed to get onto lots of expeditions. That's how I've managed to <laughs> um become a sort of authority in cave surveying is basically the only way to get good at it is to do it um, and teaching is very very variable and people will teach you the way they do it and unfortunately the only way to sort of get a good grounding in it is to is to talk to a lot of people and I'll just be one of those people for you guys so hopefully um, you you'll be able to learn from uh, some of my mistakes and some of the things I've learned over the years so this is uh, these are pictures of me in uh, from Tennessee, by the way, where I managed quite a large project, which is where I'm drawing an awful lot of these lessons from. So, how do you plan project? Um, to put it in perspective, this uh, this uh, cave that I um, was surveying in Tennessee is called Mountain Eye. Um, it was the first big um, the first big project that I ever um, went along with. Um, and I went over, said, you know, we've been surveying fairly small caves um, for the pre few previous years. Um, we would do, you know, they defined anything less than two miles long, uh, you know, um, what, three kilometers as a short cave. And so there were plenty of those to survey and I'd, I'd, I'd spat out quite a few of those surveys. Um, but this was an unsurveyed cave that they thought was about 15 miles long. Um, and so I was like, great, I quite happy to set aside two, three weeks and just get a through line of the cave and then come back in future years and build something off of it. And so I just charged in and said, oh, I want to have, um, I, I, look, I've got a PDA, I've got pocket topo and I can draw on that and I know what I'm doing. I've got a disto. And so um, I had a friend with me who uh, I eventually taught how to how to hold a disto because I'm very particular about that. And I will not be doing <laughs> this over the Internet because you can't really um, show people online. Uh, you kind of have to do it. But that's because um, uh, to put it in perspective, although I'm in general practice now, I had a bit of a surgical background and so. I like holding things very steady uh, for long periods of time. So I got a bit anal about that. Um, but getting back on track, um, I didn't really know 
you know, I think <laughs> what skills I needed um, in order to do it. And I just sort of learnt by trial and error and, and running against the wall. And the last one, who do I need? Um, that That is surprisingly um, a prescient question when you're thinking about planning a project. And uh, it's often who's available, but the what skills do we have and who do I need really do impact a project when you're planning. And so I'd encourage you when you um, think about surveying to think about how you're actually going to plan the project because it changes the way you survey. And so when we're thinking about how we're going to paperless survey, this is actually an important, important start. So to avoid too much philosophy, <laughs> if I can, um, what what is surveying? It's a bit of an odd, it's a bit of an odd term, uh, or a bit of an odd question, but there are lots of different types of survey. And so this, you know, this is a fairly, fairly classic um, survey. Um, and what this is what I would refer to as a navigational survey. So its details are mainly focused on a navigational layout. And the reason that's an important distinction, because a lot of cavers watching this will be like, well, what else is a survey for? Obviously, you want to know your way around. Um, there are features that you can put in a cave survey that tell you information about the cave. And it's all about how you read caves. And so if you've come from a more speleological background, um, you'll want probably more cross sections than this, for example, although the cross sections on this survey will be off screen because you can see because you see designated by the numbers. But even that's a choice as to when you're when you're drafting in, in at the end in your in your cartography is because that and looking at a survey and seeing how readable it is, is still a part of the surveying process. Well, Cart cartographic process. So this is the sort of principle that I, that I kind of wanted to, to get across to people, because I think lots of people have a very definite idea of what they want in their cave survey. And there's sort of there's this like escalation for accuracy or escalation for speed and you know some people are like well i can do the fastest survey well i can do the most accurate survey and i can draw every pebble under the sun and it really depends on what you're trying to capture i think this is a great survey um this is you know that this this one from new zealand i literally just typed in cave surveys into google um to to pick out a few uh, i was just interested to see what comes up but you can see with this sort of survey that the focus really has almost been to create a digital blueprint of the cave. You know, they've made comment on, you know, sand and cobbles and where things are. And those are going to change with tides and, and uh, you know, water flow through a cave, depending on depending on whether it's a, a tidal cave or not. I'm not entirely sure there. Um, and so that's, that's kind of important is actually your although caves are very static they are still a dynamic environment and so you're there to basically capture what you what you can do in 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 one frame but that can affect your drawing uh, take for example if a cave is in flood and you're like well the water level was here when i saw it but actually it could well be down there so maybe i need to revisit this section and and draw a different water level or draw and when you say draw a different water level, what you're really doing is saying, well, I need to draw a water level that people are actually going to be here for. And so that in, its, in itself is a change to a navigational survey. Whereas actually, if you're wanting a sort of baseline um, or you're creating a, that sort of digital blueprint at neutral, so you go when the water table is as, as, as normal as it can be, so not in the dry season, because you want to create a navigational survey perhaps for divers. So there are an awful lot of different um, functions that can be behind a survey that it's, that it's good to be aware of. The vast majority of uh, cave surveyors, in my experience, don't really consider this. And they've just sort of gone in as a dry caver that they go, well, this is what I can see right in front of me right now. And I think it's important if you want to sort of develop your cave surveying to be aware of not bias, but aware that you're 
th you're trying to pre present something that's objective but is inherently subjective and so that sort of, that that sort of process is well actually what do i want to spit out at the end and that's what i mean function dictates form so what is it you want this survey to do at the end and you know this is a this is a very different survey and you can see it's quite sparse on the details some navigational surveys well the passage is very easy and actually what you need is you, uh, in alabama they call them build to road maps but they're basically almost just the center line maybe a couple of walls and you know it's a sort of left right right affair but you know that in some other caves if you try to do that you just end up with this grid work mesh and actually you need to go up and then over and then under and all of this sort of thing and so that though you know that style of cave survey would actually be pretty useless as a navigational tool so that's one thing to be aware of when we're doing uh, when we're drafting surveys and this uh, this hideous mess is uh, one of mine <laughs> um there are lots of um th this is this is the the 15 mile uh, long cave that, that I this is the my final output for that um the different colors are to indicate different altitude levels um and that that's sort of one of the standard things in Therion. um you can see here that actually separating things out into altitude levels is really quite sensible because um you're getting uh lots of mazy things but actually you know you're seeing the, this big blue trunk passage underneath it all and you kind of want to capture that so that people know roughly in terms of formation what's happening it's also got cross sections along the relevant sides although quite a lot of them are hidden uh, for this particular view because i uh, rather rushed this presentation and cross sections are telling telling cavers about the geology and nature of the cave um and so you know there are lots lots of different ways to do things and lots of different ways to present things but this certainly um was a feature of its data capture as well as its final presentation so if uh what i what i thought i would do was show the raw data capture of a section of this cave so this was one of the entrance series and this is its pocket pocket top overview and so if, if you have a look at it you know you've got your uh, station to station center line that you can see in the red there um and uh you can even see i've done an offset junction which is a which is a pocket topo thing and we don't need to do in topo droid so it's uh hopefully a bit of a relic of the past but um <laughs> i'm aware that an awful lot of people uh who, who are surveying may well may well want to do this um and so we can compare it to one of the therian outputs so this is um, redrawn in Therian. And in fact, it's what this has also done is incorporate someone else's survey. And so there's been a small extension and there's been another small extension there. And one of the, um, one of the big issues with project planning and uh, what I found out with this is that if you have multiple survey teams who use different methods, what you tend to find is, is that you get misalignment in an awful lot of the survey so people have chosen different places to put the walls because surprisingly defining where walls at is is it can be somewhat contentious and then this is obviously that third form of the survey you know that's put it in a level and in this instance this is not at all helpful because everything is basically at the same level although it does tell you that this is slightly higher um, so you can see how different presentation formats and different data recording formats can be quite helpful. So roles in a survey team. Uh, I apologize if this is teaching anyone to suck eggs because uh, this is um, this is just one of those things. Uh, I uh, a little bit old fashioned in that I like the uh, three man survey team. Um, I've done a lot of two man surveying. I've even done a fair bit of one man surveying, which I do not recommend. Um, but the, the and people will call these a lot of different things but ultimately they break down into three roles which is point shoot and book point is the person at the front marking the stations shoot is the person shooting the disto and book is the person doing the data gathering and uh drawing up 
a lot of the times these roles are not extremely rigid you know i one of one of the critical faults of a lot of surveying teams is uh, a tendency to really focus on the fact that the most uh, inexperienced person should go on point because they're the ones that have to do all the running around and in my experience that's not very helpful uh, and the reason for that is is that your point person dictates um, the nature of the survey because the placement of the station um, dictates your perspective in the passage which uh, for the vast majority of times fine because you know it's a, it's a navigational survey so actually you kind of want to put the stations where the person is navigating through the passages because that's where the next cave who comes along is naturally going to be and naturally want to read the survey from so there's an awful lot of benefit in having some you know having a cave just run ahead and do the points the reason why it might be a bad idea for to have your least experienced member of the team be on point is that they choose inappropriate survey stations because they don't actually choose the natural navigational line because they've sort of been uh, put into a mindset where they climb everything squirrel into every small hole and they also if they haven't shot a disto um, regularly enough then actually they don't know what makes a good platform for shooting measurements there are other devices available we'll get to that and so um, that's an important feature. Um, it's a little bit of like, well, where do you start? Because if you put an inexperienced person on book, well, they'll take ages to learn what to do. And people say, oh, well, put, put the inexperienced person on the disto. Well, you still need to be trained on a disto as well. But I would say shoot is probably the, the easiest thing to pick up. And once you've taught someone how to do it, then they can do it. And you'll also tend to find that they get used to you. Generally, the team is led by whoever's on book. And so, again, apologies if this is teaching people to suck eggs. Um, in paperless surveying, there is a there is a distinction um, between how it was on traditional surveying and, and paperless. Is that actually the you want to control the amount of data coming in and the relevance of the data and so the you different people on paperless have very different styles some people want a billion measurements at every single station um i really developed a lot of my surveying when i was in megalaya um with an austrian team who were fantastic they really showed me how crap my surveying was um and they they had a sort of fairly standard they would do what i would call l ruds so your left rights ups downs but you know technically splays um and they do uh you know one of those at the station and they do um uh, two forward sites for the walls into uh, splays into the side of the passage if there was a corner if there was a water source and if you know they would do splays to either side of an entrance at a junction um, and they had that sort of pattern and it became automatic and they got very, very quick with it. And actually, you know, they, you would arrive at station, you get 10 shots back, but you knew which 10 shots were there were. I've been on other times when I've, you know, been with a new surveying team and I go to um, a new station and I'm presented with 10 shots, but actually I don't know the relevance of those shots. And so timing the shots and timing when the data comes through is actually quite relevant and controlling the speed of the point in the shoot is is really important it's a it's an important part of surveying and i think sometimes we don't realize because of how quick the data capture is with paperless surveying um how much more stress that can put on the person on book and actually being in control and slowing it down when you need to is a is a sent is a sensible course of action i've put that there the rate limiting step um, basically, the book is going to be the slowest thing on the team. If, you, if you're drawing right, the book is slowest. It, it just will always be. And the important thing is, is that the rest of the team there uh, have to do their job in order to make the book faster. And if that's taking measurements slower so that the book is able to interpret what the measurements are doing, that's really important. <laughs> right. Survey methodology. Um Again, I'm, <laughs> I'm spending a lot more time talking about uh, some of the basics than I than I perhaps intended. It, it's what everyone knows to be surveying. 
look, we're, we've got a load of stations, we've got a load of lines between them. The, you know, we're taking the azimuth, the clino, the distance, um, and yeah, I, I think if you want to have a more in-depth thing about that, you can invite me back. <laughs> um, the minimum standard, uh, this varies from country to country, um, but most people use the UIS grading, um, which is based off the BCRA grading. Uh, they are pretty much synonymous. Um, and from my experience, most expeditions um, go to a grade 5B, and that's because that was the achievable standard um, back in uh, the paper full days, I guess. Um, I think given that we've got a distos now, 6D is not um uh, uh, not a stretch what does that mean in english basically a uh, survey with accurate measurements so horizontal and vertical angles measured to less than one cent uh, one degree um and so that that's that's the reference to your to your three readings so your so your error tolerance um and i've got a, a note to make about error and transcription error later <laughs> um and the D is basically the um, measurements of detail. And so where have you actually measured, you know, put that detail? Is it in reference to a measurement? And so if you're, if you're ever putting splays out, I'd argue you are measuring where the detail is. And so if you're putting detail in relation to a splay, uh, it would be classified as a D. So you can see that 6D is basically normal surveying. Um, in of note, in a lot of other places that perhaps have a less developed survey culture, um, you'll get things like narratives replacing survey. So people literally giving you descriptions rather than uh, giving you full surveys. Um, a lot of places where surveying is just sort of beginning, people tend to focus just on the center line. Um, and so you'll get an awful lot less about that. And the grading does help with... Um, uh, that but again i think it's it's more a relic of the past and as more cavers are surveying um we're we're seeing we're seeing this grading system be less and less useful um this is just a, a really technical note in case anyone looks at paperless surveying resources in the future um if you talk to any of the americans they'll talk about leapfrogging you'll they'll talk about mixed uh foresights back sites um all it is, is basically, where are you taking the measurements from? Um, I'm generally a foresight only caver. So I would do, um, you know, splays from A, uh, leg to B, splays from B, leg leg to C, splays from C. Um, there's, a lot, the, there's a lot of people who worry about back sites and say, well, if you haven't done back sites, then your measurements are all crap. Um, I, I disagree. I think there are ways to pick up on on instrument error, um, but with disto surveying, it's actually very very easy to do um, back sites. And um, I'll try and find the right menu in Topo Droid to show people how to incorporate back sites if they really want it. Um, my experience is is that most of the people that are really adamant about back sites are people who survey on paper. And I, it's my <laughs> strong belief that actually most of the errors come from transcription of the data. They don't, and that's why they're adding an extra step of accuracy and that I don't think we actually necessarily need it. Um, obviously, if you've ever surveyed a load of thing and you've had one leg that was erroneous and it's thrown the whole survey out, you will understand why some people are very adamant that they do back sites on everything. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, as someone who's resurveyed, um, I don't know, probably like ten or fifteen kilometres over the years, because of that sort of thing, I, <laughs> it's something like, why are we surveying this for the for the fourth time? R Rostam, just uh, to to read some uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, so Stein Eric uh, asked if it is uh, possible to run it on a dummy Windows uh, setup. And uh, it is already been answered that the uh, top Android is only for Android yeah. uh, devices. Yeah. And uh, about uh, the 
four sides and back sides. Martin Sluka mentioned that the back side is very important to check if this to X measure uh, correct. Um, yeah, an awful lot of the time with back sides and where I have found them useful um, has been where um, I didn't realise Martin was watching. He's a bit of a, bit of a hero of mine for, for Therian. So that's uh, that's uh, mildly intimidating. <laughs> um, the, the the reason why um, back sites can be really important is that you can get, um, if you're not rotating your disto, you can get it sticking on the compass. Um, distance. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, I, I'm never going to be someone who says that back sites are, are not entirely relevant. Um, and there are a lot of cave surveyors who would slap me around the face forever suggesting not to, that I don't always do a back site. Um, I think you, you do get a feel, and certainly if I had anyone who was relatively novice, I would be fairly insistent to, to do both. Um, I know that's probably not a very good answer to the question, but um, <laughs> we'll 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 see we'll see what the feedback is from that from uh, from Martin. Definitely take his word over mine. He's a he's a much better surveyor, I think, or well, one would hope. Uh, any other questions? No, no. Uh, we are uh, free to go, and uh, of course, at the end of the presentations, we can uh, continue the discussion. I'm sure that uh, Martin has. Uh, <laughs> A lot of things to to mention and to share with us. So, is 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 he just checking the quality of this course? Is it? <laughs> he, yeah, he, well, just, he, he invented paperless surveying. <laughs> yeah, with, with no pressure, uh, Rostam, we can you can uh, continue. No worries. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, uh, what are the significant sources of error that I was talking about before? Uh, transcription error. So um, uh, I I came at this from the medical field, um, and we've uh, we'd run through um, stressful scenarios and things like that. And uh, we took an awful lot of lessons from the airline in industry, and we'd say, "Look, um, here's your rate of error in communication alone um, over a period of time." And I noticed. Um, when I was transcribing um, a load of results from a paper book over to Excel to put into a CSV to create a Cervex center line that we would then uh, draw around in Mulu, because we had to do it that way. We weren't allowed to do it another way, um, <laughs> much much to my internal screaming. Um, I noticed that my own error rate uh, was about 1%. Um, so for every 100 results, I'd get at least one wrong. Um and so I, I then reflected back and actually when someone's shouting in a cave um, with your disto measurements and they're giving you, you know, what, three readings per shot. Um, and so, and you, you know, you're doing three shots per leg and you're doing what, maybe four splays uh, per station, maybe more. Um, actually, there's a lot of readings going on there, and that one percent error it only needs to be in the center line for it to really create an issue. And I think that's actually where back. I think that's the the issue that backsite solved in the past. Um, I won't hark on about backsites, but um, I, I, I strongly suspect that that's that that's the issue. One of the other things I have noticed and actually does play a role with back sites is uh, people who aren't consistent with their station placement. And so that's what helps with um, doing back sites is that actually if you're not able to reliably hit the station or reliably take the distal away from the station and reproduce that that shot, um, maybe doing back sites will greatly increase your accuracy. Um, just to put it in perspective, though, uh, my loop closure on my four sites only approach um, over a kilometer has been, you know, le less than a meter consistently. And so um, I feel quite validated in that case. But then again, I am very particular about station placement and uh, shot placement. And so one of the good things that I haven't put in this presentation that I really should have done was loop closures and their importance in checking error. 
um, because that that is one of one of the main ways that we know that actually there isn't something else going on. Um, I could think of probably half a dozen situations where magnetic um, deposits in the rock have thrown distos off, and we've got increasingly um, uh, confusing surveys coming back um, and an awful lot of drift. And actually, the way that we ended up having to sort of correct things was to balance all the error out by doing as many loop closures as we could and then joining all the loops together um, because actually we found that there was just so much drift otherwise and that we were getting fairly large loop closure errors but in certain bits of the passage there really wasn't anything that you could do about it. Um, interestingly that's where we um, swapped our uh, survey methodology to go from foresight only to mixed so that we could avoid stations where there were bolts, we could avoid um, other things like that. So you'd be surprised how valuable that sort of thing is. Um, with uh, TopoDroid, you can actually calculate loop closure error as you go along. Um, I, I haven't done so in practice uh, very often. Um, in Pocket Topo, uh, <laughs> you, you can sort of see your loop closure error because you know, it'll 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 plot it. Um, I, well, you can see in top of Droid as well, I guess. Um, but it, it, you know, that percentage figure is always always quite nice. Uh, equipment on point. So, some people like to take a target card to shoot at. I personally prefer gloves. Uh, I, I quite like wearing um, correctly coloured gloves because uh, if you take anything that's sort of reddish or orange enough, you won't be able to see the laser on it. Um, uh, and then, you know, take a station marker. And one of the really important things I think that an awful lot of paperless teams forget to do these days is take uh, survey paper and pencil, because actually having stations that people can then find and relate onto a survey later on is really valuable, really, really valuable. Um, I've done several expeditions where, you know, I'm relating surveys back to things that happened almost 50 years ago now. Um, and you think <laughs> some of this survey paper has actually stayed in place um, and it's told me the the year and the date and the names and you know you look back in the journal and sure enough oh I can actually boil it down to which one I need question yeah actually uh, there are some comments about the <laughs> uh, backsides yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. yeah yeah I don't know what <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, some people think that you are quite brave stating that online. Uh, actually, they are using some Stelios, is using a nice expression that I'm not going to transfer here. Uh, yeah, but a lot of people are saying that they, uh, apparently, a lot of people are using the backsides. I personally don't use them. And uh, to be honest, I was hoping that you are going to say something about the loop closure because this is something that is buying me <laughs> the, the past couple of weeks. But uh, yeah, please go on. Sorry for interrupting. No, 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 not at all. Uh, yeah, I, I, know, I know the backsides thing. A lot of people are very, very adamant about it. Um, I've, se I've seen how it does go wrong and I've seen, you, you know, compass sticking because um, that, that's a, that's an issue and I can appreciate distance um, length uh, discrepancy also being an issue um, and I think I think it would be good practice to do back sites with a new team until you're you're sure that you can get decent uh, consistent readings you know but, and then doing a loop closure error um, and what once you're happy that actually you're getting consistent consistency um, one of the things I think that is different, um is that you um by doing splays because splays are inherently perpendicular you do actually test the compass and so you should be getting significant discrepancy and so if you if you're then um you know picking that up you know i, I wonder how many people doing the back sites calibrate their disto for every trip and there's an awful lot of uh, there's an awful lot of controversy about that. Um, I personally do. Uh, I, I, I I quite like to um, because it doesn't take me very long, and I get I get quite low errors. Um, but yeah, I, I think I probably won't speak any more about backsites because otherwise we'll risk getting focused, and we can save that to the end. 
So in terms of equipment, there are a few different things. You know, you've got your Disto, your Disto X2, your Brick, Shetland Attack Pony, there's the Cavatron, there's there's quite a few other things, and they pretty much all work in the same way. Um, the gold standard really is still the Disto X2. I know I might be crucified by a couple of Americans for saying that, because uh, the Brick is very good. The Brick is very good, but I think it's less ergonomic than the Disto X2. And um, although you know it gives you extra details, I'm not sure it's um, that helpful. You'll notice on the end of the brick that there's a little um, uh, uh, prop that, that, that spits out, and you can measure from that. So if you want to have a very specific from the point survey forward, you can do it from, from that. Um, obviously, uh, an awful lot of people will have a look at the back of Disto and there's a, there's also a um, little screw thread there and you can have mobile surveying platforms so you can take that through the cave. Um, you've got uh, the Shetland attack pony. I don't think that's going to take off, sadly. Um, it's a lot cheaper than all the others, but um, the battery life isn't good enough and the the user interface is, is a bit a bit too cumbersome. So um, hopefully there'll be a little bit more development on that and, and we'll get a reliable replacement for the Disto that's cheap. Um, in terms of equipment, there's, you know, there is quite a lot. Um, you can have PDA, PDAs on your pocket topo if, if that's what you've got, that's what I'd use. Um, taking a new Android device underground can be quite expensive. Um, uh, a lot of people that I know uh, in the British cave surveying community uh, are using uh, Galaxy Note 4s. There are more modern Galaxy Notes and they work even better. Um, I have seen Apple devices being used. I'm not sure what software they're using, but there are other forms of um, sketching software that are available. So that is worth bearing in mind if actually that's where um, that's what you've got or, or that's, you know, that's the that's your limitation there. What I'd say with all of them, though, protective cases is obviously quite sensible, um, although I'm fairly notorious for forgetting mine. Uh, <laughs> and I just just cave extra carefully. Um, I've never uh, I've only smashed one <laughs> in in my 10, 15 years and that's because um the a boulder the size of a small car moved <laughs> so uh, i don't care what case you're putting that in if that lands on top of it it's it's dead uh, fortunately the the disto survived though so uh, that was the most important thing um and then the other thing is uh, that's really important and i think is the significant reason why an awful lot of people can't do paperless is because they've tried either without a stylus, which I think is crazy. Uh, I could never draw anything without a stylus. Um, or that the stylus and the sensitivity of the screen isn't very good. And actually, we've got to a point where you can get styluses that are quite sensitive and you can really get quite quite good outputs to the extent where I only draft on TopoDroid now. I, I do my full Therian drawing solely in TopoDroid and then I've got a standard export um, that I put on at the end, you know, press uh, uh, F3 and F9, and then um, it spits out my surveys. Um, so I actually have uh, no longer draw up in Therian if I can help it. You know, might do a little bit of tweaking or editing or, you know, if I want to put line name, uh, label line or something like that in, uh, I'll, I'll put that in Therian. Um, there's also um, having a book, uh, you know, um, surveying with gloves and all this and the other. Um, I was going to say I never survey in gloves, and then I found about 15 pictures of me surveying in gloves, so I'm obviously a liar. Um, finally, <laughs> topo droid, the whole point of the presentation. Um, oh, Rosal, be before the top of droid, uh, let's uh, read some uh, more uh, questions and uh, uh, yeah. feedback from the audience. So Dimitris uh, is mentioning that the uh, backside and the multiple uh, measurements is uh, the best way for a better result, difficult but worthwhile. It is exactly what the total stations are making and the method we follow for professional serving. Yeah. 
Uh, George is uh, asking if uh, uh, will Topodroid support Lake Adisto D810 in the future? I don't know if, if you know about that. Uh, you're best off asking Marco, really. Um, the My understanding is, is that there is going to be continuing development. Um, if you look at the a number of devices Topodroid still supports going forward, um, there are quite a lot on there. You know, um, in fact, mine set up to support the Shetland Attack Pony uh, and the Brick, which I was very surprised by. Uh, yes. No, uh, there's just a comment from Martin uh, Sluka that he says that Disto X is an electronic instrument. So there is a problem to be sure if it measures correctly. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, interestingly, I, I remember throwing out one survey. Uh, we had to redo it again. And this was this was in Mulu. So, you know, <laughs> critical surveying uh, you know, in the middle of Borneo. You're like, well, paid a lot to be here. I need to get this wrong. <laughs> I don't want to do it again. Um, and we threw out the survey um, entirely because uh, we noticed that the uh, compass had been thrown out by people measuring um, the disto right next to the light of their scurion. Yeah, uh, but I thought scurion is not is is rated as a non-magnetic. So yeah, I think it was actually light? the bat box. I think it was the bat box that was doing it. I, I don't think it was actually the front light, um, but. We noticed okay. that that for there was one trip where actually we got consistent errors, and interestingly, four sites and back sites wouldn't have picked that up. And so, when we're looking at error, that's why I prefer to do loop closures, because um, that's how we pick that error up. Um, and actually, when we then looked at it in relation to the survey and tried to tie it in, uh, we were getting some ridiculous loop closure errors. You know, like fifty percent, and you you just like this data is useless. It's absolutely useless, and it just it just wasn't making sense. And we noticed that if unless you turned it more than 180 degrees, which is where people get this backside thing from, um, you've got an awful lot of compass sticking, and that it wouldn't then reset or take a new measurement. And so um, people could turn it less than that, and it would just give you the same reading. Um, and okay. we think that's because um, something had thrown it out of its calibration. But ultimately, what ended up happening was that we did the survey with a different set of instruments with a different team. And we did loop closure errors to tied known points. And then we got uh, an accurate uh, result so that we were able to check. You're not always able to check things. And yeah, yeah. if you get if you get straight line surveys, you know, if you're just going in in one one straight line and you you know that you're not going to get a loop closure error. I think doing back sites is very, very sensible, especially if you are planning to then break break through at the end of it. Right, uh, pocket topo. So if people have been used to pocket topo in the past, and you know you've gone through that, but um, one of the things that we've noticed is that there are fewer PDAs around, and there are fewer people running pocket topo. Although there still are still are a decent number and they've got used to it and their devices haven't haven't um, gone kaput yet. Um, I feel the sort of spiritual successor of it is uh, Sexy Topo, which is, is the thing on the right. Um, and, you know, it's that simple color scheme. And it's basically I want to sketch. Now, the reason I don't use Sexy Topo um, is just because I quite like having all of the things that I've drawn in Therian, in Topo Droid export. So um, we'll go through how you draw. But um, the interesting thing about it is that, you know, your, your point, your line, your area will all then go through. The sort of traditional way to do it is to, you know, you draw in Topo Droid and um, you then take an image file and you put that through to Therian and then you trace over it. I not entirely comfortable necessarily comfortable with the validity of it because actually if you can get your if you get a good stylus and you get get your drawing down actually you can you can draw almost fu fully finished product in the cave and it doesn't take that long uh, to put it in perspective um with careful drawing i was knocking out probably 800 to uh, 800 meters to a kilometer a day 
um, in, in my surveying of high quality survey that was fully finished. And actually, you could take it on the day, press compile, and it would spit out your spit out your your ninety percent finished surveys. Um, which if anyone's tried to run a data project in the field, they would appreciate is really quite helpful. <laughs> um, in fact, we had a few longer days where we were spitting out 1.2, 1.5. But to be honest, uh, when you get to that level, um, it's all about how easy the passage is to survey. <laughs> I've had some mega surveying days that were very, very hard fought and got about 200 meters. And you're like, well, that wasn't worth it. Um, in terms of drafting um, software, I'll go through this quite uh, this a bit quicker. Um, you know, you've got Therion, which we've sort of gone through, which I would say was uh, uh, it's the standard European software to use now. Uh, I, there are some holdouts. You know, we've got Compass, which is actually producing some things that are quite similar. Um, it's got the three D boulders that I detest, <laughs> um, but a lot of people seem to love those. You know, we've got walls, which is um, I've only ever ten, I've only ever seen in the states, um, and it gives you these hyper detail orientated um, surveys, and I I find them almost unreadable to be honest. Um, but it's it's a it's it's a lot more like Illustrator in terms of a drafting program. So if anyone's ever done uh, and ever done anything with walls or is working with teams with walls, uh, it is. It's, it's just as good, really. Um, it depends how you use it, as is, as is any tool. Uh, tunnel, um, I believe uh, this one's used on the Austria expedition, uh, one of the British Austria, Austria expeditions, and um, was used to draft the three counties. Um, uh, a lot of people swear by it. Um, I, yeah, um, I've used some code from Tunnel to um, do my own Therian exports. Um, we all, <laughs> the, the, the Therian brigade, brigade tend to say, oh, Therian is the best thing because you can do anything in it. And it's like, well, yeah, if you write your own code, <laughs> Therian is a very powerful tool. Um, I would say if you're going to learn anything from scratch, um, yeah, you have to be committed to learn Therian, but it's really worthwhile. And the reason it's worthwhile is it's um, very uh, flexible and it can accept lots of different data inputs. And certainly when I ran a project with 26 people, um, I had to accept lots of different teams um, and, and, and their data input. Um, and so actually matching them up um, was very helpful because um, you, you, could, you could adapt it in Therian. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up to people, this was uh, debuted at UIS um, uh, last year. This is called Caveware, and it's a, a way of um, uh, trans, uh, transforming your um, 3D, uh, your 2D sketches into a sort of 3D Servex model, but it will map your sketches onto it. And I think, actually, if you're running a project and you're really not techie, uh, it's, a, it's a nicely produced bit of software. And actually, that might be something of, well, I'm capturing the data. I know I'm going to send it to someone else to draft, but I need a working model in the field. I think there's, there's a lot of validity in using, using Caveware. I've been quite impressed with its outputs and actually how user-friendly it is. Uh, just to say, one of the common outputs that a lot of people want to focus on is .kmz's. Um, the, this is my project that you can see, and um, I was contacted earlier this week uh, to um, give a load of data so that people can try and connect this monstrous thing here to the caves uh, further up the valley because we're chasing this borehole that, that looks like it's following uh, the line of the valley, but just underneath the cat rock, the sandstone cat rock at the top. And so um, all of these produce .kmz files, and that's a whole nother thing, and I'm crap at making kmz files, even though it's one line of Therian, um, but it's always finding the LiDAR overlay data to make these really pretty maps that make you look really professional. So one of the things, <laughs> this is some actual uh, paperless surveying drawing, and it's it's relating to the walls. And one of the things I wanted, I thought was quite helpful, and I probably should have put it earlier in, in the presentation, um, but is how do you draw cross sections? The... This is this is the measurements I would have taken if I had a, um, a, a station on that right-hand wall. 
um, I'd have done a splay up to roughly the highest bit of the passage, a splay down to roughly the lowest bit of passage, and splay across. And that would be my left, right, ups and downs, because the right is essentially zero. Um, a lot of people with paperless, because you can take a million measurements, do this. Um, and they'll they'll do an almost dot to dot. And one of the things I think we have to be careful about when we're cave surveying is valuing the um, perspective of the caver. Because actually, if you look, there's an awful lot of underhang, even in this fairly round passage, that you wouldn't necessarily capture. And that actually this is the, this is the uh, shape that you would be drawing. And it's what I've noticed an awful lot of the time is that, that people who tend, tend to do that can often fall into a trap of actually losing, uh, oh, if I go back, you know, losing some of the shape. And actually, is that relevant um, for a little bit of the geomorphology? You know, is, is this stream tube that I'm chasing, is this phreatic roof tube actually there or not? Um, and you know, it, are we, when we've gone back into Vado's development, are we going down a, a fault or an incline? And so one thing I've been careful of is the billion splays, um, cross sections. And the reason for it is you have to be mindful. I have seen on um, a few things, and it's a new new bit of topo droid, actually, um, when you um, do splays, that you can get a couple of stations worth of splays. And so if you've got two stations close to each other, you can see the other station splays on it uh, in the background, where you can cycle through on, on the option menu. And this is, um, um, it's what I've heard referred to as a survey shadow. I'm not sure that's common parlance though. Um, so the, those hidden areas, but actually if you were then able to shoot things from the other side in the same passage, you then tend to pick things up and you know that that's why we triangulate things is because actually you get you get a better picture um it's something that really only came uh, i really only sort of started noticing after i'd done a load of um uh, cloud pointing so trying to create 3d um images from from disto data and you would take loads and loads and loads of uh, uh disto data shots and then i was like well actually this hasn't really captured the relevance of it and i realized that's because i was doing it from too few stations i think i did it from three or something like that in in a particularly odd bit of passage shape and we noticed an awful lot of light overhangs and then i sort of went back and actually had a look at uh different cross sections because i had a tendency to do a billion a billion splays and actually i noticed that i was missing an awful lot of detail and this is a this is an example from uh from that cave earlier and actually, I was cycling through the photos and was like, oh, this is a, <laughs> this is a kind of great example of it. Because actually, this is what I took um, for when I was drawing. Uh, th th these, these were the shots I took. So I took a direct up. Um, I took a, a shot to the corner and a shot to the corner. Um, and then I also took a offset down because I wanted to put that into the model because um, I thought that was the relevant bit of passage. You can see what you get from the million splay approach, and actually, it's really then hard to capture that thing going down. Um, there are lots and lots of different ways that you can potentially do it, but it's just something to be aware of. The interesting bit is where do you draw the walls? <laughs> um, and so, to go back to that first first question that that I raised, where do you draw the walls? Is a really <laughs> it seems like well, it's obvious. It's where the wall is. Um, the thing is, is when you get these narrow cracks that go narrower and narrower and narrower, it becomes a very subjective question because actually, at what point is this a a a crack that you you know you're only getting a small amount of solution down? You know, does it have to be? Is it more than eight millimeters? <laughs> uh, you know, is and the the general perspective is is that you know if you can fit a human body into it, you should probably put it on a cave survey, and I, I think that that's quite a good way to do it. But one of the things I thought here um, that I put there is that actually I've chosen to put the wall at sort of the bottom of that curve. And I think it changes in a lot of places. And I re remember being, and so this is what this looks like on the plan view, because I wanted to record that. But 
obviously in this situation the cross section tells you way more about the passage than than the plan view ever would do but you know i've said that oh there's a big step in the floor here it goes up on this side and that there's water running along the middle of the passage but realistically it is actually probably there but if i put that on the plan there then people will be like well why is there water running along on the top of a shelf that's a bit odd um and so actually if you put that on this view and then you put the water there with a clear flow marker it's it's evident that you've put the flow here um the reason i got really focused in on this is because i was on an expedition once uh, i can't remember where um but there was this sort of this shaped tube big 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 canyon rift 80 meters it was absolutely phenomenally high this thing and we were going along the bottom and surveying 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 um and you'd see very very frequently there were lots and lots of boulders in this fairly narrow canyon you know it was probably about four meters wide at its widest point and so you were able to then like climb up and you know we sort of exhausted the floor level leads and we, we climbed up a few of the bits and we noticed that there was a roof tube in the top you know it's quite a distinctive tube but in theory, these are all the same passage. So when does passage become separate? And when do you draw it as two separate passages? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, no, no uh, sorry, Rustam. About the previous uh, example, uh, yeah. there is one question maybe. Uh, in uh, that case, uh, he, chose, he chose a wrong place to put uh, his station... Uh, Maybe we yeah. should change, change the position of the station. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think that's a valid um, criticism. But it, what it highlights is actually the subjective nature of surveying. Um, the you can make an argument for putting for putting the station there, but you still run into the situation where you either have a shadow, you know, your light shadow over the or your surveying shadow over this side or actually how am i going to draw this in the plan view and the reality is is that for me the plan view with this as the profile is a better narrative it's a, it's a better way to show it because the only other way of uh, i can think of doing it is by um falsely shrinking this backwards and actually if that's if that was the way people are walking and I, i've a little bit embellished this one for effect but you know realistically if people were walking on the top here you'd you'd want to sort of put this as the dominant passage um what i was going to go on to with with uh this one is actually when does that top passage become a separate passage to the bottom passage and it's a very subjective answer and i 100 percent agree where do you put the station because with this passage how do i draw it i could say well i think just you know the top of the cave has a very different character the top of this rifty canyon has a very different characteristic to the bottom of it and for me it formed at such a different um uh it had such a different uh, hydromorphology that you know because that it was obviously initially a phreatic at the top um and you know became this this pretty phenomenal canyon um but you could see it widen out in a couple of places and you're like well actually in terms of the caver's view you could go along those little bits and so you could create almost four or five different shelves along this bit but again that felt like over measuring and putting far too many center lines through something and so actually defining um, what, what, is, what, is, what is passage can be quite hard. And I think you could make the case very reasonably if you want, you know, if this was a much bigger thing and actually had an awful lot of stuff that you wanted to record in that bottom, you could, and you can hide it from the centerline data so you don't add extra length to the cave. Um, if there's going to be an argument about that, I don't really care about length anymore. Um, I've surveyed for too long to be asked with that anymore. Um, you could put a center line in the top and a center line in the bottom and then draw this bottom as a separate scrap. But really what we're arguing over is how close does that bit have to be before this 
becomes a different passage to the top one. And that's what I'm arguing in this next one, because <laughs> that's how I ended up drawing it. You could make the argument, though, with this one, do I take the walls as being this far left and this far right? And the answer is, is that in a shorter, narrower, you know, closer bit of passage, you know, say this is 10 metres tall, I might do. <laughs> um, it's very context dependent, particularly, you know, if it's, if it's not quite as slanted over. But the reason I wanted to do this is that actually, if you followed the roof tube and you look at the bottom, you can see that actually the meanders that form the top bit are very different towards the bottom bit. And it was really hard to capture in a 2D um, survey this um, almost sort of 3D meld that's going through. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'd like to discuss uh if we have time but uh, you know an awful lot of people think that um 3d scanning is going to be the the future i really don't think that's the case it might be that what we do is we don't have um you know laser uh, um center line measurement in caves at some point uh, I've, I've been at the cave surveying group meetings and i've seen um that sort of result <laughs> um I I don't think I, I don't yeah we actually did uh, so when I when I first fanned around with it um we found that we had the sort of loop closure errors that were north of 5% fairly routinely actually an awful lot of some of the some of the developments in the last few years and some some of the AI that calculates it uh, we did um a sample where we got a loop closure error of 0.5 um which is pretty damn good. Uh, it was taking about 20 minutes to do uh, probably um, th 30, 40 meters of passage, I think. And then they were they were doing the post processing at the end of it. So actually, the raw data capture was was quite quick. However, you get this, you know, fly through model, and it all looks very fancy. But then when it comes to guiding you through a cave, you haven't got time to watch this fly through thing on a on a screen what you actually want is a 2d representation of the 3d space and you know in very much in the way that google maps yeah they do have that pop-up view so that you can see relief and and the topographic but everyone still uses the 2d interface and mapping as that nature you know creating that 2d interpretation of the 3d space is always going to be there and so I think that that's something that we should sort of focus on and appreciate that there, this is actually going to be a problem for quite a while. Um, and until we can develop some smart software that can interpret um, 3D spaces and provide consistent, uh, more objective uh, 2D interpretations of something, and then we can have a massive argument over where we put the walls. <laughs> um, so topo droid time. Uh, one. So this was actually the main point of this this talk. I've I've gone way over uh, <laughs> my time, so I, I'm really sorry about that. Um, topo droid is a fantastic bit of software, but the real key to it, um, and topo droid X uh, is much better for it than than uh, the previous versions of topo droid. Um, some people might be a little bit alarmed when they sort of look on Google Play and they're like, well, uh, TopoDroid is sort of no longer being supported. Um, TopoDroid X is, but TopoDroid X can't be put through the Play Store because of some security certificate thing. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a bit beyond me, but that is continuing supporting. And if you go to the TopoDroid website, they, they do explain it all there properly. Um, what I do is whenever you get your topo, whenever you get a topo droid. So bearing in mind all of that guff that I told you at the beginning about what am I surveying for, um, this is where it really features in. And so you know, if you go to the main settings and then you go to, um, uh, I would, or, I'd encourage everyone to try and set their activity level at least to expert, if not to tester, um, and then you know click enable additional palettes and then you go to um 
palettes on on that main menu there. Oh, yeah, go yours. Uh, Rostam, one question from uh, Stein Eric: If uh, would it you use slope symbols, triangles, to indicate the sloping wall between the two levels? Uh, yes, um, it's because I was drawing that um, quick uh, representation in paint uh, that I um, couldn't be bothered to um, f scrub it in because I was doing, <laughs> doing it with a mouse <laughs> because, ironically, I didn't have a stylus when I was preparing this presentation. So Steinerig is 100% right. <laughs> um, I would use triangles. Um, although, actually, if you look at my TopoDroid um, layout, and I'm not sure there is a proper TopoDroid layout, um, I use line slope rather than um, point slope, so it, in, in the palette thing. Um, and the reason for that, uh, well, the reason I mention it is actually that comes out as a series of dashed lines, which is the uh, standard American notation. Um, and I think uh, I think it's maybe standard UIS notation, but I, I might, you know, I, I think the triangle actually might be a BCRA thing. Um, but you know, you're talking about minutiae of uh, symbol sets there. Um, interestingly, Therion has a load of different symbol sets that you can map whatever you've recorded in your drawing tools to that. And so that would change the symbol set. Um, or you could have like multiple different symbol set exports. And that's what I do for my American stuff. I have a American standard um, set and a you know, British standard set, because otherwise I don't know what map I'm reading. So uh, it spits out two, um, which is one of the multiple benefits of Therion. If, you, if you've if you drawn it, you can just go, oh, I'll replace this symbol with this. Uh, but yeah, I quite like the black solid triangles because um, I eventually learned which way they were supposed to be pointing <laughs> after, the, after a year of using them, which was an absolute bloody nightmare. Um, so one thing I wanted to say um, about these palettes, uh, was the, there are lots of different drawing tool sets. So, you know, and you know, I tend to only use Spelio, Spelio 2. But actually, if you go through some of the others, I'm aware that there might well be people here who have a real focus on some of the other things and, and really like drawing point symbols or having area symbols, um, uh, areas for different things that they're picking up. Because I can appreciate that an awful lot of my surveys, uh, is there mud, is there sand, is there rock, is there boulders? Um, I've created a couple of um, uh, hybrid things. So one of my area uh, configurations, I've set uh, debris to be small stuff, and then I've, I've mapped biological debris to be a sort of manual input because actually I'm not I'm not doing that um, as very uh, very often. But this is kind of what I mean when you're drawing. If you want to automate your drawing, you need to be aware of how you need to fiddle with it at the other end. One of the things, uh, I think it's the next slide. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I think is is crucial if you ever want to try and automate your topo droid drawing is to get Bezier curves and to draw in Bezier curves. And actually, you, you'll you notice that you, you change your drawing style a lot. Now, this isn't a panacea. And one of the things that I think is useful to think about topo droid is how am I going to use this? And if your answer is, I'm going to use this as a sketchpad, I do not want any of this data being transferred over. I do not want a Therian export from this. Or I do not want a um, top of drawing export from this uh, into Therian. What I want is I want the image thrown up against the background, and I'm going to draw it myself in Therian afterwards. Um, then actually what you probably want to do is not have Bezier curves. What you probably want is basically, yeah, I'll do the walls in red so that I know that the walls are walls, but pretty much everything else I'm going to use on the free pen because that's how I've always surveyed. And actually I want to do the post-processing and I want to make those decisions that I've kind of talked about already later and i want to make them outside of the cave i think actually if you get used to drafting and and sketching in in topo droid inside of the cave it changes that where do i put the walls question and anything that changes that i think changes well obviously changes the survey 
And so it's one of those things that's worth reflecting upon of actually is there consistency here? And if I change my survey method underground, oh, the survey changes, mm, there probably isn't consistency. And then need to have a bit more of a thorough think about how I approach cave surveying and where I choose to record the data. Um, again, subjective. <laughs> And so I think that's where we can find an awful lot of discrepancies between sketches. What I would say, though, is that although I've made a big point through the um, uh, the video of that you, you can get lots of um, discrepancies between different sketches, is actually I've been I've found it remarkable. Um, how many resurveys that I've done that I've then taken to um, something that was uh, sketched by someone in the rain on a bit of paper with a carbide lamp and traditional instruments, even, even 80 years ago in, in some bits of the UK. And I've been like, this looks the same as my sketch. And that's really quite heartening. <laughs> I mean, maybe we're both crap, but um, um, I think... I think there's merit for an awful lot of people if you're testing this out to survey and to survey a couple of bits of things that have been done by different people with different methods to actually check potentially what your biases are and what theirs are. Because And that's why I do it against multiple is because um, there's an awful lot of um, tendency to just think that you're a bit crap and that maybe those guys were doing it right or even, even the other way around uh, if perhaps uh, you're, you're slightly bold. <laughs> um, now, I think, oh, yeah, I've got one more. Uh, this is the really big tip in TopoDroid that's really helpful. Um, Deselecting what you don't use to make these menus usable. Um, and literally going through and think, oh, am I going to use this? Do I want this on my export? And my general advice is, is if you're not drawing for um, exporting, um, you know, basically doing all your all your drafting in TopoDroid and then and then um, clicking on your compile button at the end or do, doing your sort of minimal adjustments in Therian, um, that actually you probably want to deselect a lot of these, and an awful lot of these are actually similar symbol sets. Um, and an awful lot of people will be like, well, what's actually the difference between this and this and this? Um, enabling palettes will give you more of these options. Um, I'd suggest really having a proper sit down and being like, OK, here's my um, UIS symbol set. So, you know, ju just go to the UIS, get your standard cave symbol set, being like, OK, well, I, yeah, OK, I, I probably want to draw with this. Um, but actually, I would want to freehand these symbols because I think placing a point for every single one of these is going to be tedious, and I don't like it. Um, I think, yeah. So one of the things that I wasn't able to do, and I arrived too late to set it up, and I'm so sorry, guys, um, I wanted to cast my phone to the laptop to sort of really quickly go through a couple of, a couple of examples. Um, but I've not managed to set it up uh, during during the the period the period when we were preparing for the stream. Um, stupid patients and all that getting ill. <laughs> um, there are three things here: point, line, and area, and those are the um, standard ways to um, draw up in Therian. Uh, points are. Um, points that will exist on the survey. So um, there are quite a few things that could be labeled as points. Um, one of the uh, first things that comes to mind is all stations come up as points, so, which makes sense. You know, it's, it's a point that you want defined. You've then got things that can be then put as points like columns or um, what they, I think the Americans call them pillars or is it the Europeans call them pillars? Anyway, pillars and columns. In, for for me, a pillar is made of rock and a column's um, uh, style, uh, but I know that for a load of people, it's the other way around, and so that, that's always very confusing. But I can see why you'd want to use that as a point, because you want, okay, there's a defined thing there. 
but uh, an awful lot of the time, if you've got a million st uh, stalagmites or stalactites, actually, I want to put area defined, and then I use the white area, so user defined area, but to denote calcite. And then you, you know you you put that area, and then you put a couple of the points on, or you could freehand say, look, this is a you know cloud forest or whatever. Um, and so you kind of want to be aware of what your symbols represent. You know, if you've got half a million stalagmites, um, <laughs> you're not going to put a point for every single one. And so there are multiple ways of drawing the same thing. Broadly speaking, lines. Uh, for more directional things, so walls, um, slopes. Uh, you can draw rocks with lines. So, you know, I want to actually put the specific outline of a rock in there. Um, if you've ever looked at any of my surveys, you'll find an awful lot of hand-drawn rocks, much to uh, my uh, <laughs> some of my surveying team's um, furora, because I, I like spending time. One thing I would uh, say in defence of myself is that it's really worth spending time um, accurately drawing or realistically drawing rocks um, in areas uh, where, where you've put stations. Because I think, you know, you have to think about what this survey is going to be used for. And if at some point this is an exploratory survey and someone's going to want to tie him back, you at least give them half a chance in hell of actually finding, finding the damn survey station. And so spending a bit of time at survey station saying, oh, look, there's, there's a bit of a funny shaped boulder. Actually, I reckon they probably recognize that in plan view if they if they spent the time. Um, it can be quite a good habit to get into. And it has it has saved my ass when I've gone back to um, resurvey things on a couple of occasions. It's actually, oh, um, you know, <laughs> this was there. And in fairness to the other people, actually, if I had had that survey paper <laughs> and pens and pencils, um, it would have been even easier. So, yeah, like I said, I am a bit of a have-a-go idiot, and uh, I've made lots of mistakes, so hopefully other people can learn from them. <laughs> um, I promise I have learned from most of mine already. Um, the other thing to say is, you know, between um, points and areas, uh, obviously, you know, with lines, you've got water flow. You've also got water flow as points, and then you've got area as water. You can see how all of these can overlay. And what I'd recommend with all of these things is actually just trying to draw them with using all of the different ways. So, you know, get your um, standard uh, data set out, or if you've got a project, you know, scrub. So, what I was hoping to do, uh, and I will see if I can. Just pop it up to the camera. Um, what I was hoping to do was, I've got Topo Droid X listed up here. So you can see there's a lot of things there. And what I was hoping to do was actually scrub, scrub out all of this and then, and then just draw along a center line and try and illustrate the points that way. Um, one of the interesting things um, about... Uh, Sort of, sort of drawing along in topo droid, and this will only mean anything to anyone who's tried to draft in in Therian. But um, you can now draw in scraps in topo droid, and it, that makes me thoroughly excited. Um, you have been able to for a while, but obviously due to the pandemic, I, I stopped surveying for a couple of years, and it was it was a it was a great pleasure to come back and find out that that <laughs> that, that was the case. Um, and it's because I hadn't refreshed and updated in a while beforehand. Apparently, it's been a thing for years. Um, but scraps are sections of the drawing. And uh, one of the things to think about in Therian um, is that you can have multiple different scraps that can overlay. Um, <clears throat> and actually, the order in which you put them in, in, in your drafting software will say, oh, this one goes on top, or, or this one goes on top. Um, it's how you define area colors. So, you know, those pretty pictures that I showed you earlier on of the things stratified to different different levels, you can say, I, I want it, everything, each scrap has to be colored in its height level. And so actually the practice now is to sort of try and draw in scraps in relatively short lengths um, so that you can then start a new one and, um, you know, you'll get more graduations in, in your data set. And when you're putting it through at the other end, it looks a lot better. 
Um, if you're not drawing Ethereum, don't worry. <laughs> Just ignore that. <laughs> Just draw everything in the same thing. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, am I able to cast my screen to this? Because uh, the only other thing I've got. Yeah, I, I think it would be quite interesting if you try to do that, <laughs> actually. Rostam. Okay. Is I it... think uh, it's worth giving it a try. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, this is where this is where you come, come to learn uh, some <laughs> some software <laughs> for instance, someone who's then not able to uh, open, uh, not able to use the computer properly. It's uh, it's my own damn fault. Uh, so I'm really sorry, uh, everyone. I was really hoping to have enough time at the end of the day to do this, but. Um, as I possibly mentioned, my, <laughs> my last patient was uh, was very unwell, um, and I did not have the ability to uh, just say, oh, no, I've got to um, talk to a load of Greeks about surveying. Um, so I think I've got that up now. I say a load of Greeks, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that in a dismissive, <laughs> dismissive tone. Uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling here. I can't see a, a relevant button. Have uh, either of you guys got a... Oh. Ooh, uh, can you maybe, see now? Maybe you should uh, remove uh, your presentation first. Oh, yeah, that would okay. probably be sensible. Right, you can just see my entire screen. That, yes. cool. That's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> right. So um, one of the things I like, and you, you, anyone who organizes files properly is going to have a fit when they have a look at this, but this this is um, a GitHub repository of um, my data set from, from the state. Um, interestingly, uh, <laughs> just to go through, the reason why they've put a mountain eye fixed on there and Mountain I split is that the very first time I went over back in, I don't know, 2017 or something, um, I did all of it on Pocket Topo, which you can see there, um, is one of the da data inputs. Um, and what I what I ended up doing was uh, I surveyed on a single, um, single scrap in Pocket Topo, and I did um, uh, about uh, five miles on one survey. Oh, sorry. Um, and that, <laughs> uh, it, when we tried to run it through Therian, it broke and I had to um, send it around the world for people to weigh in on it. And I got one email from Finland, which was literally just, ha, 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 how, how on earth did you do this? <laughs> and so it was quite, it was quite impressive to be laughed at for, for something, for something like that. Um, so I'll just pick out, uh, so if I go for one of the exports, so this is this is one of the maps, um, and I just wanted people to see that actually, you know, this is this is this is quite a big survey. So this is 15 miles worth of passage, and the the PDF uh, size size is massive. It should really be put in an atlas. So this is not the optimal presentation set, and you can do that in Therian. Um, but you can see that as you sort of scroll in, actually, there's quite a high level of detail. Um, one of the things that's quite inconsistent here and one of the challenges of managing a project and why I should have spent a bit more time is that you can see that there's over level of detail on some bits of it. And then actually there's bits of detail that are relevant there. You can see here that in the drafting software, whoever's done this has used point boulders. And so the point boulders have come up like that. But then you can see where my original boulders, when I drafted this section, are. And I've, you know, I, I've, you can see basically this sort of uh, artificial cairn there and these bits and pieces. And so, unfortunately, this one's a little bit rough and ready. Um, but it should, and it's also in the American um, symbol set uh, style. So it, that would be replaced with uh, triangles. 
Um, so if oh, I then go back to oh, uh, one of the things that's worth having a look at, and one of the reasons why it's worth messing around with Therion, is that you can um, you can get your sort of three D models that you can that you can spin around. This is a fantastically boring cave um, to to do a three D model of, because uh, over the um, five miles end to end uh, sorry i should be using kilometers uh, the americans have infected me uh <laughs> there was 75 meters of elevation change or something something silly <laughs> um and so this is possibly one of the flattest and thus most boring caves to look at in a 3d view um but you can generate lock files and uh, and this that and the other but if i open so if i go into not export sorry Again to 2019, I open I mean, one of these. And so this is what your survey looks like when you export your data. So this is all the centerline data and the displays. This is, um, you know, if you fill in, one thing I'd really encourage with TopoDroid is when you start a new project, it'll say date, um, project name um, and then also the team if you put all of that information in actually it's really helpful you'll notice here that the the, the it uses notes for book um instruments for shoot and dog for point um so like i said there's lots and lots of different things um i've heard it referred to as different animals and if i press f2 and open we should get and this will be the plan view rather than the extended elevation view um, and this is the bit that everyone likes to draw. And hopefully, this is the nightmare bit, isn't it? This is why you don't demo anything, just opening it straight out of the box. And so, uh, I think these might be quite large scrap sections, unfortunately. Um, one of the... Um, issues with <laughs> Therion is that if you've drawn very large scraps and you're ed editing those surveys that actually it can take a while to then redraw everything when you zoom out although this just isn't zooming out at all for some reason uh, I don't know why that is because it's moving um so this is the this one was uh, sketched originally and then overlaid and you can see that this was sketched in pocket topo um originally and it was probably done by me and i probably gave my uh, topo droid file off to someone else um i quite like this um feature of pocket topo where actually it will give you a um, cross section with splays that that go out and you can just pop it plop it straight onto the plan view and then you can go around in um topo droid so if anyone's got their topo droid x out and ready um you can create a cross section but what you then do is you you um i think you put chris christos will probably actually be better, be quicker on it than me um trying to use two things um, but you can essentially select po uh, point cross section, um, and then you can bring up another window. So it'll give you a separate sketch window to draw your things around the splays and, and cycle cycle through it. Sorry, you, it's a line cross section originally. So you draw it through the bit that you want to put your cross section on, and then it will pop up a separate window, and then it will convert that sketch into a point, and then you can move that point around the. Um, around the the plan view which is really helpful because um often when you're surveying you end up drawing these things and the cave then turns that way and you're like, oh, i've got to i've got to redraw it and i've got to move it all again um and so you can see actually you know i have drawn triangles originally and the way that i've mapped it onto here is by using these lines um just as a very simple um uh, explanation of scraps this really isn't cooperating i'm so sorry guys um uh, the follies of technology eh? uh, <laughs> um the, the each of these sections so um if you then uh, 
go through like this. Eventually you get to a grayed out section. If I haven't put every, absolutely everything in one scrap, which it looks like I have. Oops. Yeah, I have. Um, I'll try and open a different one. I apologize for any obscene names. This is what happens when you let uh, British cavers um, name their own files. Uh, obviously, you sort of have an agreement at the top um, to uh, say, look, if you put any obscene names, I'm just going to change them in the, in the end. And this one. So that's what happens if someone starts a sketch and then doesn't nestle it. And so this is where you get into <laughs> um, people using multiple different bits. So Dwarf Fortress, I recall, has been. Uh, there we go. And so this is, if I just have a quick look, all in one scrap. <laughs> oh dear. Right. So um, this was this was originally drawn in Pocket Topper and imported again. Um, and you can see that this is someone else. They have a very different sketch style and hence all of these round boulders. And then someone else has come over the top of it and then drawn um, the the wall set um, and then uh, gone through. So if I uh, just do a little bit of deleting. So obviously I'm not going to... Um, uh, um, I'm not going to save any of this um, because obviously it's someone else has taken the time to draft it. But then if I show people just how to trace over and sort of the principles of line um, uh, drawing. So if we go to line here, and this is exactly the same as it is in TopoDroid now, but you can start with your point there, and then you go to that. And with your Bezier curve, you can match it to roughly what it looks like. Now, one of the things I would say with um, styluses and curves is that an awful lot of the time, you can lose the feel of a cave by making it too smooth. And an awful lot of people like to have a little bit of a nick or a little bit of a um, reflection in the cave passage wall of not necessarily the, the millimeter accuracy of um, does this bit indent here, does this bit um, pop out here, but at least a general reflection of the, um, not necessarily the type of scalloping, but the, the those sort of micro meanders that aren't that forming the large bend. The reason it's actually quite important to capture that is it does give you a little bit of information when you read a survey. And you think, oh, God, that was probably formed by quite fast flow. You know, it's got those lots of small wiggly lines or, you know, those those jagged bits where you um, got jutting bits out from chert um, that I've ripped so many suits and so much equipment on. Um, you kind of want to preserve that. And actually, I think if I go to uh, the main export file again, so apologies. Um, I go down here, this is captured in my drawing here. And so actually there was a series of parallel rifts. And if you're walking along and suddenly, you know, you were looking at the survey and then you look left or right, you can see, you can see that. But then even going back, this isn't a smooth line, but it's very deliberate because actually that is kind of what it reflects. It had these large scallops, but although I've not reflected uh, in the wall and uh, <laughs> this view has all the cross sections hidden, so it actually would have been sort of shown in the cross sections, <laughs> um, you do get 
you do get information as a caver from that and actually it sort of confirms your oh oh no i am in the right bit of cave so that is data that is definitely worth recording so uh, if i go back to this one and that and um, we're going to the drawing view so we then open up this uh, I won't tr try and spend too long on this, guys. I'm sorry. Um, there we go. That can't be maximally zoomed out. Right, okay, well, let's just pretend we're drawing something else. And then, so let's say there's a parallel bit of passage here, and say, you know, I'm going with this, but actually, I want to sort of change my drawing style. And I've got this uh, tiny little alcove here. And you'd be surprised how quickly you can get some walls done. And it all depends on the scale you're drawing at. So if, if you're doing a, a very large, um, uh, a very large bit of cave um, and uh, you actually don't necessarily want to capture all those micro details I'd argue that um, if you're capturing raw data you should capture the micro details and then you can always redraft it later um, it's a much better way of doing it but obviously if you're drawing over data then you can simplify it um, when you draw lines in Therian the general practice you'll see a little yellow tick on one line and it's to pop it onto the inside of the passage um, and so if I then, uh, the other way they tell you sort of is to naturally draw things anti-clockwise, which I just did the, did the opposite there. So let's say we've got something like this. Um, I should have put insert scrap at the beginning of this. So if, oh yeah, I've, I've done already. So the scrap is which active bit of the drawing is going um and so you know if i wanted to change scrap you see how that's grayed out and that's exactly the way it is in topo droid when you have different scraps so if i click on that it suddenly um switches and then this is the active drawing and this grays out and the reason that can be quite helpful is that you know it, you basically then can ignore it but you can also use it as um if it's relevant to your active drawing of actually oh this crosses over at this section or this is um, really closely uh, mimicking this passage or, or mirroring it. Um, okay, and so then we'll go to points. So this is a point and then you can select. So that's done a station. And so let's say we have a set of stations through the passage there. Obviously you want to um, map them onto those black dots, which is where the stations are and those center lines. Um, and if you do that, actually in Therian, it will automatically, uh, most of the time, put an ID on those station points. And so it will tell you what station that is, which is, is really quite smart. Um, if we look at some of the other things that we can do, you can see that there is loads and loads of different things in the Therian um, uh, library. Um, that sort of reflects the palettes that are in TopoDroid. Not entirely, um, but you know it is still a way of recording data, and there are ways to sort of represent it and expand the the standard Therian um, uh, palettes. Or uh, um, you know, obviously, we've talked about reducing the TopoDroid palette. Um, one of the most sort of common things I end up using is label. So I've turned that one into a label. So let's say I've I wanted to move that and put that there, and then you can um, you can write what you want to say on that. Um, you can then, uh, if you click on orientation, it brings up an arrow, and then you can move whichever way you want, and this will move the whole text. The reason I wanted to show people that is actually not for label, but for water flow. And so if you have that there and you wanted to use a point water flow and actually the water flow was going this way down um, the, the passage, um, 
then that would just create a point with a little squiggly line with, with, with your standard water flow symbol on it. A different way of doing water flow is to also use a line. And actually, I quite like using lines for water flows because let's say it's actually going this way. Oop. Uh, I'll just delete that last part. Apologies, I'll draw that again. Um, I quite like using a line, and one of the reasons is, and Martin will probably smack me on the hand for this, is I quite like <laughs> um, putting them to go out of the borders of the wall to show that actually it goes into the wall. And I'm a little bit lazy with my areas as well, so if I wanted to say that this is all water, uh, oh yeah. So in, this is one of the differences between Topodroid and Therion. Um, if you wanted to have um, water as an area, in Topodroid, you just click area and then it will draw things. In Therion, you have to do it a slightly different way. Um, and you basically go to border um, and then you have to, you sort of draw your area with a line that you want. And I um, do have a tendency to um, be rather economical because actually the only bit where it matters so long as your uh, drafting is right is the bits between the walls because those will be the only things that should be um, uh, um, confi uh, configured processed processed in the end and so it'll only be the stuff between the walls that shows up um, here if you don't want a nasty line on it you can click subtype and you can put it as invisible and then when you choose area you get area water and then you just click this and then it'll be all of that area there is another way of doing it you could feasibly click this line and then have one line across there click that line then have one line across there click that line have one line across there and click that line um so you can use multiple lines to do it uh it's gone wrong for me in the past and i, I tend to try and teach people the simplest way i can because um i'm a simple man and i've managed to bugger things up multiple times but um the way i do it seems to work pretty reliably um and then the last thing i want to show is just those boulders so let's say i wanted so i've selected rock border as a line there um and i want to draw a little boulder you know, you can even have your Bezier curves. You know, for this, actually, your Bezier curves probably don't help. And so you can just click point to point to point. And then if I um, deselect, you can see, although that looks like a series of points, its output, that will be a, pen that will be a pencil line there. You'll get that. And then this area here will be, will be, um, covered in. I would process it, but I'm aware I'm actually using a live survey, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, I, again, I'm happy to go through any um, of my export um, uh, uh, stuff just to show people, you know, how how these actively um, pop out. One thing I would say about Therion, it is it is really trial and error. You can see here I've even coloured boulders in using air, area fills. Um, and uh, one of the things I did here was I left um, a border um, colored in, mainly because actually this is the stream bed, but it's a dry stream bed. Um, and that was um, uh, denoted by label. And so writing is helpful. On here, um, this was a, a quick output as a demonstration um, because the uh, and one of the things I did was hide all labels and hide all cross sections um, just because it actually uh, we, we needed it for a different purpose. And rather stupidly, in the last four years, um, my laptop died and I never updated the GitHub repository. So I have to um, unfortunately <laughs> redo, redo a load of work. But that is a lesson in keeping um, things backed up on something like GitHub, because actually it's really easy to lose computers and data and things like that. All right, guys, um, I think that is me. Okay, thank you, Russell. Thank you so much. <laughs> actually, as much as I was expecting. <laughs> 
But uh, we, we had uh, actually, you also had this idea. And he texted me while you were talking. And uh, maybe you can make just a screen recording video with your phone, highlighting some stuff that you wanted to show to us uh, on Top of Droid, and then okay. we can upload this video on the comments. Um, or, yeah. So, so the really good one um, has already been made, really. Um, and I'd go to Derek Bristol's video on Top of Droid. Uh, so I can I, c I can send you that because actually Derek Derek's uh, does go through it pretty comprehensively. I'm more than happy to uh, to make one myself. Um, it will be worse than his though because uh, um, I know the way I use it, and his is actually a little bit more general. Um, and I think that I think that's the key with Topo Droid is actually realizing that it's a bit of unfinished software. And it's got so many customizations and menus because uh, poor old Marcus got to, uh, he was trying to create a tool that was appropriate for loads of people. And as a result, it's sort of the default settings are appropriate for no one. But that's almost the nature of the beast. And it's kind of the nature of Therian as well. The two are very well matched. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, uh, I mean, there was a conversation between Martin Sluka and Stein Eric on the, on the chat. And uh, yeah, a lot of people are saying thank you for your presentation. I also got a lot of uh, messages that they are not here, private messages. They, they asked me to thank you for, for your talk. So I don't know, yours, if... Uh, no, no. Uh... Yeah. No, I mean, I uh, would like to thank uh, Rostam for this uh, presentation. We're really happy uh, for this introduction uh, about Ethereum, about TopoDroid. Uh, it was uh, really interesting and uh, hopefully uh, many members of uh, Proteas will uh, follow some of these uh, guides. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rostam. Uh, and of course, be, 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 uh, that uh, they... Uh, watch with us uh, your presentation. Be before before we close, I I had the I have a, I have this uh, question for you, Rostam. Mm -hmm. Like it's more maybe a philosophical question about uh, the way that we are doing the cave service. Like, yeah. what you would recommend? Like doing these cross sections in every station, or um, also taking some arbitrary sorts uh, on the cave walls. Um, I think you're trying to get me uh, crucified again for, for back signs. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not my intention, really. Um, no, uh, I, I think it varies. Uh, one of the cave surveyors I, I learned from, uh, who fantastic surveyor, um, Andrew Atkinson, he takes uh, cross-sections at every single station. He, that, that is raw data. And so the more data you put in, the more you can go back to it and then correct things later on. And actually not putting cross sections in is, is kind of lazy. I'm a little bit more flexible on it in that actually I tend to do it every five stations, but I put more stations on. Um, you can argue about error creep with stations and station stations. But again, if you loop close it, actually, you've got a good check on your error. Um, always do a cross section wherever the passage changes. And if the passage is changing rapidly, you know, you'll be doing cross sections at every station. Occasionally, well, actually, very frequently, I will put a um, station at, you know, I'll just say, oh, no, we need a new station here. You know, people say, why? We can shoot all the way down the passage here. Uh, Mulu is a classic for that. You'll get people trying to put a station, a leg 50 meters down the passage, and I'm there like, no, we're, you, stop. You, you know, I can't draw 50 meters freehand. That That's not something that I'm comfortable with. Yeah, I know it's a train line tunnel and we put two splays and it doesn't really matter. Oh, uh, well, okay. Um, but actually, there are two or three... Uh, changes in the cross section of the of the passage, and so I've then based my station location on cross sections, um, and so I, I've then done it that way. Uh, did you mean something slightly differently, or have I answered a slightly different question? No, actually, you answered my question. And the the, the other the other thing I would mm -hmm. like to, I mean, okay, everyone has its personal style when uh, style, yeah. let's say, when we are doing our cave series, but uh, like uh, if there is 
like a rule of thumb on how often do you take a station and um, like yeah if you can say something like general like this if, if i'm gonna you say have this, it's this, all, this it's all subjective. With, uh, yeah but 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 you had this talk with stein eric and Molo about uh, taking a, a, a station in uh, you said like in every in a distance that equals five times the width of the passage so that that's yeah. that's what style eric was doing um but that was but he, you know his um my understanding of what he was doing was actually that he had a he, he was wanting to calculate volumes and um for for a different flow uh flow rates through the cave and so actually he was interested in that data um, the most and that reflects the survey you know when I started out all of this and gave a 20 minute uh, <laughs> 20 minute long um, honing down into function dictates form that's exactly you know if the point of this survey is to capture that data then yeah that's what you do I mean for me um, if you look at an awful lot of that the other thing I would say is that the cave very much dictates when you can do a station um, and normally when you see stations two or three meters apart, you know that the cave is going to be quite hard work because um, you're going to be bending every single little, little bit and it will take a long time. You know, if I see a hundred meter, uh, you know, a three, four hundred meter series and there are a hundred stations in it my heart sinks because <laughs> you're like oh this is going to be this is going to be a rough bit of passage to get through whereas if you see 300 meters and there's four stations you know that it's going to be a absolutely complete walk in the park and that someone's taken the mick really by only putting four stations in um i would i'd say it varies on your team it varies on the cave and it varies on what you're trying to capture and I think being clear about all of that at the start and making sure that everyone's on board is one, how you can get a team that aren't continually frustrated with the book persons telling them to slow down because we're not going to capture all of the data. Because one of the biggest problems you get in survey teams is the lack of buy-in from the point and shoot. Um, and so if people don't understand what the data they're collecting, they're part of the data collection team. And so if they're not on board with you, they're going to put their stations in places that aren't going to facilitate what you're trying to capture. You're going to introduce a different type of bias into the work. And actually, you know, you've been really mindful about it. Um, and until you sort of train them and actively manage the team, you're not you're not going to get on top of that. So actually being fairly, um, fairly cognizant and saying, look, no, I don't want that station there. I, I want that station over here. Here's why. Here's the bit of the passage I'm trying to draw. Here's the cross section that I want. Here's what the cave is telling me. And here's the narrative of the cave as far as I've understood it. And I'm putting this understanding into um, some, some graphical form so that someone else later on can then come look at it and then understand the cave perhaps in a different way. And yep. uh, one, one last question from uh, yeah. Martin uh, Sluka. If you have tried the uh, draw line only with points, points, not uh, curves, and then use the option convert to curve. Yeah, I, um, I, I started doing that quite a, quite a long time ago. Um, so I, I have done that. And there's one of the things you have to learn with Therian is there's a million different ways of doing the same thing um i it, it's a good point and you can convert line to curves it will simplify the points and um i there's a there was a bug with some of the old uh, versions of topo droid where you would draw a line and it would put loads of points in and it would really slow the program down because actually each point takes up a bit of memory and so when you were working on slower devices it, you, you really noticed it and that was where simplify line to curve is really good since just drawing standard in bezier curves actually um that and in the latest um couple of um editions i've not noticed that problem so much but it is a really useful tool and i know some people swear by it you know they, they go look I, I want to draw it this way and then i will tell it to simplify to curve i'll have a look at it and then i'll move some of those points around until it's what i want and that's that's a hundred percent valid way to do it okay. yeah, I'm, I'm never going to correct martin obviously <laughs> yeah he, but he, he he agrees with you so yeah so i think uh 
yeah, there are no, uh, we don't have any more questions. So I think it's time to thank you yes. for being here. <laughs> Oh, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry I talked for so long. <laughs> no, actually it was really nice. And uh, the feedback that we are getting from uh, the people that they were following is like quite uh, positive. They, yeah, I think everyone it, enjoys it. If, if, if ever anyone wants to discuss things further or, um, you know, wants to give me a shout for anything, I'm all, I'm one of the biggest survey nerds out there. I, I love, love talking about this stuff and I love helping mm -hmm. people out. And I might be a bit crap with the technology, to be honest, but uh, I'll always give it a go or I'll know who actually can fix it and I'll, I'll ask them. <laughs> we, we are not going to put your email under the description of the video, but uh, yeah. People, you well, can yeah. uh, look for Rostam on Facebook, and yeah, you can. <laughs> I have I have a very very searchable name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Easy name. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, that was it. Thank you very much for having me. Th thank yeah. you, Rostam, and thank everyone for watching this presentation. Good night to all. Bye bye. Yeah. Good night, Bye everyone. Bye. bye.